So uh, things Jesus never said. So we've been, uh, this is the second part of a series we've been in for a little while. Um, what I, one of the things I love about this is uh, my wife sent me, she's, uh, I can talk about her because she's not in the room right now. She went back with the kids' church. But uh, she sent me a message while she was in Thailand. And she said, I don't like that graphic. Because <laughs> she wasn't, normally she's a part of my preparation and all these things, but she wasn't a part of this one. And I said, uh, honey, that's because we're making fun of it. That's, <laughs> that's the reason why we're using this graphic. Um, I don't know about you. I remember, uh, grow, I didn't grow up in church. Uh, but I grew up in the South, which is about the same thing sometimes, right? And so uh, there was a lot of pictures of Jesus. And I just remember thinking, you know, uh, suspicious, suspiciously, Jesus being from Israel, why does he look like a Roman white guy with a straight nose? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So I, I had questions in the early days, and I still have questions. But one of the things we're doing in this series is um, in order to find out the things that Jesus really did say, Sometimes it's helpful to go after some of the myths and some of the, you know, old wives tales, some of the social media stuff that, you know, I, I preached a series called uh, Facebook Theology and how maybe that's not the best place to get your theology. <laughs> but uh, so often we see things online that we look at it and go, you know, some of it obviously is tongue in cheek and it's kind of making fun. But if we're not careful, some of us actually think that's actually how Jesus talked or that's some of the things he said, or even if he didn't say it that way, that's kind of like, like, kind of like what he meant. So here's a couple of examples again. Um, go into all the world and preach whatever makes people happy. <laughs> you know, that's not in the Bible. Another one is, whoever wants to be my disciple must affirm themselves, avoid the cross, and follow their own heart. <laughs> that's the woke Jesus right there. Um, the last one is, ask and it will be given to you because God is your celestial sugar daddy. <laughs> and so that's just kind of a picture. So often, again, um, what Jesus actually said sometimes is, is a little bit different than what maybe we thought he said. So I want to uh, start with a, a story. This is a, it's actually a, something that happened in, in the life of Jesus. And this is uh, John 8 is where we're going to jump off. But when we read this story, um, follow along to the end. And, you know, there's a lot of, lot of meat in the middle of it. So I'm going to point some of that out. But as we get towards the end... Jesus says something really, really powerful. And so we're going to kind of examine some of the things Jesus didn't say in this context. And by doing that, we're going to really emphasize what he actually did say. And the reason why is because the things that Jesus actually did say will literally transform your life, right? If you can really get a hold of some of the things that Jesus said, um, it will literally transform your life. So this is John chapter 8, verse 2. It starts out, it says, At dawn, he, Jesus, appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. So imagine this is kind of like a Bible study. Um, you know, it's not super formal. He, he's, he's, it's pretty early. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's amazing how, how uh, he sits down and, and begins to teach, and people just start gathering around because he was so interesting. And then verse 3 says, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. So that's interesting. Um, it says, Then they made her stand before the group. So, so imagine, you know, we're doing community group on a Friday night, <laughs> and a bunch of religious people drag this naked woman in and, and make her stand in front of everybody. So it's, it's hard to wrap your head around that because in our context, we're like, that's never going to happen. But never underestimate religious people. <laughs> that's the first thing to learn. And the second thing, though, is, uh, is I have, whenever I read this, I don't know if you do this, but I have questions, right? So first of all, um, where's the guy, right? If she's caught in the, in the act of adultery, I'm not sure if you know a lot about math, but it takes two to tango. So I'm like, my question is, where's the dude, right? <laughs> and, and my suspicion is, more than likely, the dude was one of the Pharisees, which is why he was not present in, the, in, the, you know, in this picture. I could be wrong, but that's my thought. The second question is, um, how exactly did you catch them in the act of adultery, like what were you, what were you peeping at, <laughs> right? You, you bunch of creepers, right? Like, uh, right? Because most people, when they decide they're going to commit the act of adultery, try to do that as privately as they can, right? And so then my question is, how did you discover this going on? So anyway, it's, it creates a lot of questions. But the truth is, they could care less about this woman. You kind of see this as the story goes along, verse 4. It says, and said, they, they put this woman in front of the whole group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. 
in the law of Moses, uh, or, or, sorry, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman. Now, what do you say? And so they present this question to Jesus. And then it says, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. So here's, here's kind of what they did. There's a motive behind their question. This is often what you find when you, when you have a conversation with someone who, who, who says, I'm spiritual, but not a Christian, right? Or I'm religious, but, you know, I, you know, whatever that phrase is, it's just a motivation to kind of do their own thing. And they usually have an agenda. So they're trying to put Jesus in this no-win situation. So if he agrees to stone the woman, then he loses his reputation for grace and a loving shepherd. Right, so because that's kind of the presentation he's been he's been uh, bringing out to the crowds, uh, and if he makes an exception, then he's condoning sin. So, in a seemingly um, unwinnable situation, Jesus thrives. <laughs> I don't know if you know this. It's like uh, try to put God in an unwinnable situation and see what happens. Right? He's always going to win. So we kind of know what's what's coming. But Jesus bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. Now. I've been preaching into this for 30-something years, and uh, I remember how much fun it was to preach this part. Because <laughs> part of it is, is nobody knows what he wrote, right? There's no way to know what he wrote to some degree. And so there's been speculation, well, what did actually, what did Jesus write? And, you know, some of them, uh, some people say he, he wrote down the names of the Pharisees, like Phil and his address, and the, and the girl that Phil was sleeping with, <laughs> right? right. Listen, if your name's Phil, I'm, I'm just thinking Phil the Pharisee. It makes sense in my head. I don't know. So if your name's Phil, I apologize. But, you know, did he write down, did he write down their address? Did he write down their name? Did he write down? So he wrote something that captured their attention. Some later manuscript said he wrote uh, the sins of the accusers down, right? So we don't, again, we don't know for sure, but it's interesting in the, if you study the, the original language, the, the Greek word for write something down in this particular passage, it can be translated two ways. One is just to write down, write something down, just what you think. The other way is to write down something accusing. And so that's the way this, this word is translated in this particular passage. He didn't just write nothing. Okay, that's helpful to know. He wrote something that got their attention, and it was something against them. So again, it could have been super specific, like we all preach into, you know, because we kind of hope for that. You know, it feels like, you know, it's a good way to smack a religious person, right? But it's interesting, there's a passage, a lot of scholars believe he was actually referring to a pa passage in Jeremiah that all the Pharisees would have been, um, they, would, they would have understood this, they would have been aware of it. And that's Jeremiah 17, 13, the last part of it. It says this, those who turn away from you, God, will be written in the dust. Isn't that interesting? Like when he, so maybe he wrote that scripture, you know, maybe he just wrote the reference. No, he didn't do that because they didn't have those back then, <laughs> right? But maybe he just wrote Jeremiah, you know, maybe he just wrote um, those who turn away from, I, I don't know. All I know is whatever he did captured their attention because again, their motivation, their agenda was all evil. And Jesus just, he just upset the apple cart, right? So remember the whole time this woman's standing here. So Jesus, you know, they're using her, um, it's fascinating to me, they're using her um, to try to do something terrible to Jesus. So, so it's, it's worse than just accusing her. It's, it's accusing her and using her death as a pawn to try to catch Jesus in a trap, right? Like the wickedness knows no bounds sometimes in religion. And so Jesus, again, basically is pointing out that judgment, the judgment of God is upon all of us. Like, who's going to break free from being judged, right? If you, it, it, you know, James later on says, if you offend in one part of the law, you offend in them all. And so Jesus is really pointing out, hey, if you're going to, if you're going to judge her, let's, let's, let's talk about that, right? He, he took their, <laughs> he kind of took their, uh, their agenda and turned it back on themselves. And so verse seven says, when they kept on questioning him, so he, so they didn't even stop. They just kept trying to push. And Jesus straightened up and said to them, said, no problem. You didn't get the, you know, you didn't get the writing on the, on the ground. So obviously, so let me say this, let any of you who's without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Some versions say, let any of you who aren't with, who are without the same sin. In other words, all of you jerks who have committed adultery and got away, thought you got away with it. You really didn't, you know, maybe that's what he wrote. Um, he goes, so have at it. 
And so now it rises up inside of them, you know, and they're starting to think about that. Okay, I can keep playing the game as if I'm innocent, or I can be honest about what's going on. I can recognize the truth. And so obviously we see what goes down. It says, let any of you who's without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. The actual translation is not just without sin, but any of you who didn't even want to sin. So he took it further than just sin and, you know, doing it. He took it to the, to the core of the heart. Remember Jesus says, he, and we talked about last week in the Sermon on the Mount, um, he said, you've heard it said, but I say. He said, you heard it said about the law that it's just about doing the offense. And what I'm saying to you is, all the law is pointing out is the offense begins in your heart and that it ends when you break the actual law. So if you, if you hate someone in your heart, you've already committed murder. If you, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've already committed you know, a sexual immorality or adultery. And so Jesus goes after this in, in a big way. Um, I don't know if you ever noticed this, but it's really easy pointing out everybody else's sin and, and difficult to remind yourself that you also might have sin. <laughs> so keep that in mind as we move forward. Verse 8 says, again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. I, I really want to, when I, first, one of my first questions when I get to heaven is, first of all, Lord, why don't you want to watch? That's my first question. Second question, what did you write? I really want to, but I, I probably won't. First of all, I probably won't, I won't care about the watch thing because I'll know, right? I'll go, oh, that's, I totally get it, right? And I'm not going to care about anybody else's sin because I don't want to talk about my own, right? Like we've, we've finished that. Let's, let's move on to whatever's next, Lord. I don't want to talk about anybody's sin, especially my own. So this is what interesting, what's so interesting. He stoops down on the ground, verse 9. At this, those who heard, not everybody hears when you say things to them. I don't know if you know this, especially husbands. That's for you ladies. Um, again, he stooped down and wrote in the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. Isn't it interesting? The older ones first right? Um, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. So just keep in mind, this whole interaction, this, this woman has been forced to stand there in her shame and her guilt and the condemnation waiting for the rocks to come, right? Because again, when, when you, you say stone, you think about what you threw when you were a kid. That's not how it worked out there. If you've ever been to the Middle East, I don't, know how, I don't know why they do this, but they make their stones with razors. Like they're the, some of the sharpest, I mean, they're evil looking little rascals. And you, you get hit with one of those, it doesn't take many. And usually they're quite big. It doesn't take long before you're dead. And she's standing there waiting for that moment to come in her shame the entire time. And, and I love that Jesus, as much as he wanted to deal with her, he had to deal with the accusation first because in, in the way he was going to deal with these accusations is how it was going to affect her in such a major way. And we're going to see that in just a second. But I think it's interesting, um, it maybe a reminder, just because you're old doesn't mean that you have wisdom. Just because you're young doesn't mean that you don't, right? Um, part of this is in their day, if you were older, you were expected to be wiser. And probably they had realized if they were older, they're like, you know, I really can't argue with the, the aspect of I'm also sinful. <laughs> Sometimes when you're young, you're like, nah, I'm good. I got this. I'm, I'm not so bad. And then you've been around a little while and you go, like, man, I've been trying to do right for a long, long time. And it seems the harder I try to do right, the less right I actually get to do. So anyway, he goes on. Verse 10 says, Jesus straightened up and asked her, and I love this. He said, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Where are they, the accusers? Has no one have, has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, sir. So think about this for a second. When Jesus asked that question, she was not unaware that when she watched all the Pharisees, because again, I don't know her story. I like to try to get into her head a little bit, and we're going to try to do that in just a second. But just in this moment, when, when he said, where are the people who condemn you? She wasn't just thinking the Pharisees who dropped the rocks and walked away, because she kind of you know, she saw that happen. What really probably had captured her heart was she was looking at the one man who, if she was honest with her own heart, knew, I don't know what it is about this guy, but I'm pretty sure he doesn't have any sin. And so if anybody is going to condemn me, if anybody is going to have the right to throw a rock, I'm looking at the man who can. So she wasn't out of the woods yet, right? Right? She's standing there, all the self-righteous people had walked away, but the one righteous one who could actually judge her 
was standing before her, and she didn't know how that was going to go. She had been taught her whole life the law. Here's the standard. Um, if you don't meet the standard, these are the, you know, if you, if you do well, this is good things happen. If you do bad, bad things happen. And she was expecting really, really bad things to happen, obviously. But listen to what he said. This is something Jesus didn't say. Go now and do whatever makes you happy. <laughs> he didn't say that to her. He also didn't say, you know what? Just follow your heart because, you know, that's, that's what you need. He never said that. He didn't say, you know, you do you, boo. <laughs> he never said anything like that. What he said was, go now. It's interesting to me, he didn't just say go. He puts an emphasis on right now. Go right now and then do what? He said, first of all, I'm the only one who can condemn you. I'm not doing that. I'm not condemning you. And the moment now she grasps, oh my goodness, I've, I've received mercy where I deserve judgment. She was not unaware of this. And so in that moment of revelation, Jesus says, go now, go right now and leave your life of sin. So think about this for a second. I don't know, like I said, I don't know how she got there, but whatever that journey ended up at, I'm pretty sure that's not what she thought was going to happen. She, I don't think she ever thought that at the end of this, you know, going into this relationship with this man or whatever it is, that somewhere I was going to be right on the verge of destruction, judgment. I'm, I'm right on the verge of death. I don't think she ever thought that, but there she was. And in the moment of revelation where she says, the one person who will not condemn, the one person who could condemn me has chosen not to condemn me. Now his attention moves from, I don't condemn you, and that revelation flooding her heart to immediately after going, go right now and leave your life of sin. So what's that all about? right? First of all, she didn't know that that was a possibility, <laughs> right? Her whole life had been under the law, trying not to sin, trying to leave a life of sin, trying to get away from all the brokenness and the hurt and the pain that ended her up where she was right now. And in this moment, Jesus not only doesn't condemn her, he, he says, there's something that's available to you that you were unaware of. And I think this is kind of the crux of how this works, right? So he was basically saying, hey, this might have been what you did, but I'm telling you now, it doesn't have to be who you are. It's interesting that one of the things Jesus didn't say is, I don't condemn your sin. Right? It's not what he said. He said, I don't condemn you. But in the same way of saying that, in the same context, he was saying, I don't condemn you. But the understood part was, I don't condone your sin either. Like when you preach grace, one of the first things people say is, well, you're just okay with sin. And I'm like, okay, okay you not head. First of all, that's how I start that conversation. Um, go back and look at everything I've preached in the last 15 years or so, right? You can't, it's not all online, but there's enough. And find out whether I'm for sin or not. <laughs> just go look. It's, it's not hard for you to go find that out. Secondly, if you would listen to what I'm trying to say, you are acting as if you're not sinning. I, this guy laughed at me one time. He said, you know, he said, I cannot believe that you are at, you're saying this to your people. If you keep saying that about sin, people are going to go out and sin. And I started laughing and I said, I just find it amusing that you think your people aren't sinning. And the truth is, as a pastor, we've all been there, that we see sin in our congregation. We see the brokenness, we see the hurt. And in our zeal to rescue people and see people set free from their sin, Almost all we talk about is their sin. You ever notice that? And it turns out Jesus is like the one time that anybody could have talked about sin. You've got a naked woman caught in adultery. You beat up the religious people for being religious, right? So you've got all that sorted out. And now if you're going to talk about whether somebody should do right, somebody should shine up, somebody you need to stop it, the first thing you would start with is not, I don't condemn you, like leave that hanging so it has more power, right? That's how preachers do it. And then have that conversation about go and sin no more and how dare you and, you know, use, but that's not what he did. He flipped it and he said, I completely forgive you, the only one who can. Now, because of that, something about that moment of revelation that he doesn't condemn us is the only thing that actually releases us to live a life without sin. The harder you try not to sin, the more you're going to sin. That was the purpose of the law to show you that it was impossible in your own power to stop sinning. That's the whole point of the law. It was a, the Bible said it was an instructor, a teacher, a, a schoolmaster, like, like, 
It, it just laid into you lesson after lesson after lesson after lesson over your young lifetime going, you cannot do this. So what's the message? You need someone who will do this for you. And in that moment, don't you know that woman saw, is this the one who's going to take away our sin? Because it feels like he just took mine away, right? And then he says, now I want you to go and sin no more. So here's the, one of the lessons is don't become your sin. She had committed adultery, and the, the religious people wanted to call her an adulteress. And there's some truth in that. But was that who she really was? And Jesus said, no. Jesus said, this sin, I see your sin, and I see who I made you to be, and those things don't match up. And I would really like you to recognize that this, this, this is not your identity. This is not who you are. What I'm saying to you about your forgiveness and your freedom and the life that you could live without all this sin— that's who I'm saying that you are. Powerful, powerful res re uh, revelation. So why are we so easily tempted? Do you ever wonder this? Why do we so easily give in to sin? Well, first of all, it's appealing. I don't know if you know this or not, but um, sin is pleasurable, the Bible says, for a season, right? And so um, one guy said, I don't understand why people sin. And my question then was like, like uh, well, because it's fun, First of all, right? Sin is so much fun. Some of you guys are like, I can't believe a pastor saying that. But here's what I'm saying to you about sin. If you don't think it's fun, you probably weren't doing it right. That's all I'm saying. Because sin has a draw on the front side. That's the problem with it. Give, me, give you an illustration with kids. Do you have to teach your kids how to eat sugar? Like for me, it was Coca-Cola. Like we were poor, but the one thing that my mom would, would buy, and she, she'd buy it you know, in bulk because you could get it cheaper, she would buy two liter Cokes. And so probably I would be six foot five right now and very muscular had not I drank so much sugar as a kid, right? But she never had to say, you know what, son, here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna place before you a choice. You can drink this healthy water or you can have this water with, you know, eight pounds of sugar in it. And I'm like, uh, let me pray about this. Like you don't have to do that with your kids, right? So of course sin is appealing. But that's part of the danger. Sin promises satisfaction, immediate satisfaction, at the cost of disobedience to God, and just as importantly, eventual pain to you. And here's the key, it's eventual. So think about this woman, again, try to get in her head a little bit. Was she evil? And the answer is probably not. She was probably just some lady who, you know, she's living in a society that you know, doesn't think too highly of ladies, first of all, which is sad, but it was true. And, you know, and maybe uh, it doesn't say she was married. It doesn't say she wasn't married. It says she was caught in the act of adultery. The assumption is the, the, the man was married, you know, because that would be the, the tendency to lean into the masculine side of those things. But she probably was married. Maybe both of them were married. And maybe she, she didn't have a horrible husband. Maybe he was abusive. I don't know. Maybe he was just not there. Maybe he was just focused on, you know, his, his, his job or, or, you know, just making a living or just trying to take care of things. Maybe he was struggling with sickness. Maybe he was struggling. Maybe he wasn't paying attention to her like he used to pay attention to her. When, I don't know the story. I just, I just don't think that she was just straight up evil, right? I think she was caught up in something like, you know, she's at the office and her husband's not been paying attention to her. And now her boss says, you know, hey, how, you seem like you're a little down. What's going on? How are you doing? And he begins to show her some attention. And then he, he shows her some kindness. And then, you know, maybe one day they stay a little later than, than everybody else. And they're there by themselves. And, you know, and he just, he says, you know, I don't, your hair is, I, I just noticed, you, did you get your hair cut? She's like, yeah, I totally got my hair cut. And my stupid husband didn't even notice my hair, you know, and it's like, and I got highlights and everything. And, and, right? and you go through this whole thing and, and then, you know, he, he gets up to leave and he brushes by her and accidentally touches skin to skin on her arm. And she's like, oh, did he do that on purpose or was that, you know, an accident, <laughs> right? And so it goes down this and then he starts, you know, sliding into her DMs on Instagram. You know what I'm saying? It's like he just starts kind of leaning in a little bit more than her, and her husband's like, I mean, she's like, oh, my husband doesn't get me, but this guy gets me. And then, then this thought goes in her head. It's like, you know, probably I married the wrong guy. That's probably the problem, right? And so one justification after another leads to the moment where now she's in bed with another man. She's uh, destroying her own family, his family, and potentially... Some of these other Pharisees, I don't know how much, I don't know if she was just a loose woman or this is just one, I don't know. But I just know this, 
seemingly insignificant decisions led her down a path where now she's standing before her accusers naked on the verge of death. So sin is so insidious, not just because it's death, but the way it grabs hold of you is not this sudden thing that says, hey, you know, if you, if you do this, let me show you the end of it, right? <laughs> That's not how sin works. Sin just promises all these amazing, wonderful things. This shortcut, this, you know, this pleasure that's, you know, it's, it's worth whatever you pay to get this pleasure. And it's like we talked about last week. It's the same concept of, you know, you're coming in, you're so hungry from, from hunting, and your brother offers you, you know, a, a bowl of soup, and all he really wants in exchange for that is your entire inheritance. And like, what are you going to do with that inheritance anyway if you die, you know, right now because you haven't eaten in 45 minutes? And so, you know, you take the soup and, and lose your inheritance. And isn't that what that looks like? Immaturity is grabbing hold of, of the, the temporary um, at the cost of the eternal or the lasting, right? Isn't that right? Like we always look at those guys, um, this is a guy thing maybe, but we always look at those guys who have very muscular bodies and, and, and you know, we're men. And so we're like, dude, if I, if I worked out, I would be more buff than that guy. But right now I'm going to have this Twinkie. Because <laughs> <Right? laughs> it turns out, I don't know if you know this, working out's hard and it's difficult. And, you, and stupid people want to get up at four o'clock in the morning and go do that because that's when nobody's at the gym. Or I don't know. I, I, just, I just know what I'm not doing. <laughs> but the point is, is like if we look at this and go, it's so much easier to give in to the, to the moment, right? Which is what happens. But if you give in to the moments long enough, what begins to happen is you begin to give in to the eternal. The thing you are doing begins to take on an identity of its own until it takes you on and you become that identity. It's, it's really interesting to me. Paul goes after this in a couple of places and he says, um, don't be deceived, right? God won't be mocked. So he's saying, hey, there's a, there's a way things work. And he said, one of the ways he is, um, here's who's not going to inherit the kingdom of God, right? The homosexual, the adulterer, the drunkard, the liar. Liar? Is that the same as like some of those other? I can't be right. I mean, it's just a lie, right? So what are all those things? And there's, there's several more. But why do all, what are all those things have in common? They have become the thing they started out doing. The good news is that works in the opposite direction too. What, it turns out that what you behold is what you become. What do you think worship is? Worship isn't just singing a song about God. Worship is seeing something that's worth something. That's where the name, you know, the, the word worship comes from. It, it's, it's, it's looking at something for its value, right? And seeing its true value. So when we worship God, what we're really saying is I'm ascribing to God who he really is and his value and who he is, to, who he is in, in reality. Not what I think he is, right? But who he actually is. But here's what happens. Here's the fundamental problem that comes from this. Is it happens because for the most part, Culture has told us there's no such thing as an absolute truth. It's called moral rel relativism. And so what is that ultimately? And it's just that, that this thing relates to something else. It doesn't stand alone as an absolute. Except for that's not what's true in Scripture. And, it's, and the truth is it's not what's true in this world either. So here's an example or just a thought. Without a belief in the absolute, which is what our culture has built, truth is defined by whatever makes me happy. So without a belief in the absolute, truth is defined by whatever makes me happy. And secondly, when the bottom line then is my happiness, happiness becomes the standard by which I judge my actions. Now think about that for a second in the context of this woman. So what, what did that look like? You know, again, we don't know the full story, but part of what we know is she didn't wake up one morning and said, you know what I think I want to do this afternoon? <laughs> I think I want to stand naked in front of a whole group of people, including the Bible study, you know, the, the pastor, uh, maybe the son of God, a bunch of religious people, um, and wait for rocks to come at me until I die. Yeah, I'll do that, I'll do that after breakfast, right? Because it's dawn when that's, <laughs> right? I mean, she didn't start there, and she didn't start the day before. She didn't, something began to happen where unhappiness, something about where she was, 
made her begin to pursue something that she thought was going to make her happy. And the enemy comes and lies to her and says, hey, if you go down this road, you know, you're not happy here, but if you just pursue this, it's going to make you happy. And she believed the lie, and it started out something small and something, you know, just one or two things here or there, but then it diverged into a path, right, that started out very small, and now she's ended up far, far, far away from God, far, far away from her family, her, the culture, society, her own, what, what's that going to look like? And, and the answer is, in that same way, whatever that path, there's a, there's a famous uh, a book about this. It's, it, it's called the, um, the uh, something of the path. I can't remember the, the phrase now. But it's basically, it's saying that it's not, you can talk about all you want, how you didn't want to end up here, but how you ended up here is because back here, you took a, a small turn that you chose to make. It's a turn that you, you, you can justify it all you want, but every turn that led you here was going to take you here because that's the, that's the pattern, right? That's, that, that's how paths work. So, but what occurred? Why did this happen? And why is it so easy to fall into this? And I think one reason why is because we have a culture that says that happiness and holiness are at odds. In other words, you can't do the right, something about the right thing is not going, it's always hard, therefore it's not going to make, it's not going to make you happy. So are happiness and holiness at odds? It's a question I think it's worth asking, especially if you're a believer. Do you have to choose one or the other? I mean, if you choose holiness, are you destined to live a miserable existence? Are you going to have to wear, you know, pleated khakis and a polo sh- Sorry if you're doing that right now, but that, and, and when I was a kid, if you were going to be right with God, that's apparently how you had to dress, right? You know, it's just, it was just a rule. But you know, are you going to have to dress up on Sundays? Are you going to have to go to church every single Sunday of your life? Oh, dear God. I mean, you know, I'm going to have to give some of my money to, you know, and you start going down this road. So in choosing holiness, am I destined for a miserable existence? But here's what God says about this. This is Matthew 7, verse 11. It says, if you then, though you are evil, in comparison to God, you're evil, Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So the, the picture then is you have a loving heavenly Father, but he only loves you just enough to make you holy, but not enough to make you happy. <laughs> right? And somehow religion has told us this lie that if you're going to be right with God, then you're going to just have to stop having fun altogether. So, and if you're curious about whether that's true or not, you should be introduced to my wife because she puts her fun pants on in the morning and she never takes them off, right? She has a good time all the time. Karen and I have been partying our whole life back in the 80s. We partied in sin and then we got saved and then we started partying the way Jesus meant for us to party. I don't know if you know this, but if you go back and read the Old Testament, um, God made sure in the law that there were parties that you had to attend. There were celebrations that you had to be a part of. Part of your tithe was to be set aside to have a party with. It was designed to celebrate the Day of Atonement and some of these other things. It was, God was designing celebration and fun into the mix. And somehow along the way, we have equated holiness with misery. And it's not true. So let me just give you an example. If you're looking for happiness and you're not finding it, it's probably because you're looking for happiness in all the wrong places. You're looking in a lower place when you, look, when you should be looking in a higher place. So what does that look like? Max Lucado had an example about a fish on a beach. I don't know if you ever heard this. But he said, if you take a fish and you put it on the beach, is it happy? No, it's flopping, and it's flopping for a reason, right? It looks like it's having fun, but it's not having so much fun, right? We had a little boy, a friend of ours had a little boy, and he, and he said, uh, he was holding a frog, and he, says, he said, Mom, he said, I think this frog is sick. And she said, why do you think that? He goes, because it threw up. And she's like, no, honey, it's because you squished it. <laughs> right? And so here's, the whole time the kid's like, this, this, he's had so much fun, he's sick. That, he's like, no, no, you killed him. That's how that works, right? In the same way, it's like we put a fish on a beach, and we think, oh, I know, if I give it other fish around it, then it'll be happy. Is it happy now? No. Let's throw a party for the fish. Let's have some margaritas. Let's have a good time. Let's drink till we're numb. You know, let's party like it's 1999. Now is the fish happy? No, no, no. Let's give the, let's give the fish a playboy. Or I mean, a play fish or anyway. You, <laughs> let's do that. Now is the fish going to be happy? And like maybe for a moment, it stops flopping. <laughs> but it's going to start flopping again because it's, why? Because it's never been designed for the land. It was created for the, for the ocean. 
And so no matter what it does, no matter what you do, I mean, you see the analogy, no matter what you do, if you're trying to find happiness here in this earth alone, you were never made for just this earth. You were made for something so much higher. And that's the picture that Jesus is trying to paint. He's trying to say, hey, if you, if you go after happiness in this world, you will, you will find it. It'll be fleeting. It'll be for a moment, but you will find happiness. But in the meantime, you're flopping. In the meantime, you're losing oxygen. It's a slow death, but it's a death nonetheless. And so you were not made for this world. You were made for God. And we know this. Sin promises satisfaction at the cost of disobedience to God and eventual pain to you. We know this. No new car, boat, boyfriend, vacation, enough likes, amount of money, new hair, new body, pair of shoes. That's for the guys. Self-esteem will give you the joy your heart craves. Why? Because none of those things can fill that void that's in your heart. Because it's shaped like God, and God is the only one who can fit you. So holiness is the pathway to true happiness and joy. This is something Charles Spurgeon said. He said, holiness is the royal road to happiness. That's going to come up in just a second, that royalty. And he says, the death of sin is the life of joy. But isn't it interesting that the more we try to get rid of sin, the more we long for it. It's the taboo. It's the, oh, you shouldn't. And so why? Because something about it is, oh, if you'll just come, if you'll just do this, if you'll be a part of this, you're going to be so happy. And, 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 we, and we've tested it, especially when we're young. And we're like, you know what? It does, it, it does sort of work. Like, I'm kind of happy. Like, I remember I, I never drank. Um, I, I, I got drunk one, one time, and I didn't like how it made me feel, so I never did that again, right? But not everybody like, is like that. Maybe that's your thing. Maybe it's not. But for me, I, for me, it was a really interesting thing. I, I was pursuing internally. I had an internal dialogue. I didn't pursue sin on the outside. I, nobody saw my sin on the outside, so I was perceived as a good person. I wasn't. I was really dark on the inside. Um, so I started pursuing whatever I could pursue. And so one of those things was martial arts. I'm like, I, I couldn't find anything else that did it. So by the time I was 15 years old, I was a third degree black belt in the martial arts. And so I'm going to put a picture of me up here. This is, um, this is me at 15, one month after my 15th birthday. And so I was in the newspaper um, I had, uh, I was teaching at the school at the time as a black belt, mostly younger people than me, obviously, but I was teaching black belt. But by the time I was 17 years old, I, I, I owned the school and I was making way more money than a 17 year old should make. <laughs> and so I was 17 years old living the life, you know, everybody respected me, all these different things, all the things as a young man, I thought I wanted. I was looking at a car. Um, it was a, it, you probably wouldn't recognize it, it was a Corvette and it was like, $50,000. And so I'm a 17-year-old kid looking to buy a $50,000 vehicle. I don't see that going wrong at all. <laughs> so I'm very thankful that that actually never went through. But this was my life at the time. I went to Hollywood for an audition because some people recognized me and they're like, hey, let's bring this kid out here and try out for a movie. I didn't make the movie. And it turns out it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me. That if I'd have gotten involved in that lifestyle, with the brokenness and the hurt and the deep darkness that was in my own soul, I can't imagine what Hollywood would have done to me. And I don't want to imagine. So in so many ways, you know, at at the time, I was so deeply disappointed, but I was also, I look back now and go, wow, God, thank you for rescuing me. And so in this time, when I was 17 years old, I was dating a girl. She was older. And so, of course, you know, that was, you know, it's just, that's the stuff younger guys wanted, an older girl, right? So um, we broke up, and then about a month after we broke up, um, she was in a car accident, and she was killed. And so um, she was super outgoing. She was the life of the party. She drank way too much. She partied way too much. She liked to drive too fast and dangerously, and so that's, that's what happened to her. She was drunk, and she went off the road, and she hit a concrete culvert, and it killed her. And so now there's a funeral, and so I, I, I go to the funeral, and I remember, you know, all the young people are just crying and boohooing and, you know, making it the whole thing about them, not even her. And I, I remember walking up to the casket and touching her arm, and it was cold. And that was 17 years old. That was my first real understanding of death. But I didn't understand it at all. But this revelation hit me while I was standing there. And I was like, she was so full of life, so full of happiness. She was having such a good time. And where is that now? As this thought just hit me. Um, this was her house, and she's not in it anymore. 
And I, it was interesting, no thought came to me that this was the end or this was, you know, this was final. None of that. It, it was just that wherever she is, she's not here now. And that really got a hold of my heart. And I remember going home and, and praying that night. It wasn't a prayer. It was just a thought. And I said, God, if, if you are real, I would really like to know something about that. Because whatever this life is, I mean, imagine I'm 17, not even lived any life really. But I pursued something and, and, and gotten there to some degree. People were, you know, people thought well of me. You know, I was, I mean, for all intents and purposes, I was very successful at 17 years old, right? And, and yet the emptiness now was deeper and darker than it was when I first started because in the pursuit of all those things that I thought would make me happy, I was anything but. And maybe that's something of your story. Maybe for you, it was alcohol. Maybe you got, you know, you got to the point where you're drinking so much, you're just trying to numb the pain that you didn't even know you had. I don't know. Maybe it's food for you. Maybe it's porn for you. Maybe it's something else that captures your attention and it promises you something, but it's been lying to you the whole time. And no matter how much you try to get, it never actually fully satisfies. Maybe it's a nagging guilt that just won't go away. Maybe it's the, the feeling in the sense of, I don't know what this is. But if this is what life is all about, I don't think I want it. And what's interesting right now is our culture is making a big deal about opting out. In other words, coming to the place where the enemy knows life is not, you know, this life in this world in pursuit of happiness is not going to make you happy. And it's going to make the darkness even darker. So now I'll push into the culture, the world, the culture, a value system that says, it's actually okay if you want to check out. It's actually, you know what? It's actually beneficial. It's actually, you know what? If you're sick or you're struggling or you're just in deep depression and you're just like, I don't want to deal with it anymore. Man, let, there's an there's a easy way out. All it, all it, it's just death, man. It's, it won't even be painful. It's just you'll go to sleep and that'll be the end. And truthfully, isn't that better on society actually than you just taking up all the resources of society? Isn't it better that maybe you're not here? And so in this whole process, the enemy leads you into the darkness that makes you want to take your own life and then builds into the culture that that's acceptable. Isn't that insidious? And it is. And so maybe, maybe it's not even something that took you away. Maybe it's success. Maybe like me, standing there getting ready to buy a car that I think if I buy that car, it's going to make me happy. If I get this part in this movie, it's going to make me happy. If I have that girl or that whatever, if I have whatever it is, if I just get one more thing, it's just going to make me happy inside. And I don't know about you, but I learned that that was not true. Maybe, maybe for you, it's not any of those things. Maybe for you, it's a critical spirit. Maybe for you, it's, it's not even about the things. Maybe for you, it's a comparison thing. It's like, you know what? I might be bad, but I'm not bad, as bad as that person. And then, and then because there's so much trash and brokenness and in, in things inside of you, I can't deal with that. So the way I take my eyes off that is I'm critical of every single other person. I'm critical online. I'm critical to my friends. I gossip. I say things I ought not say. Why? Because when I'm doing that, it takes, the, it takes my eyes off the brokenness and the hurt and the pain that's inside of me. So what do you do? What do you do if you're still in that place and you're struggling? How do you get out of that place? How do you move forward? How did I get here is probably what that woman was thinking. She's like, here I'm standing. This is not what I signed up for and yet up here. But thank God, thank God, there is forgiveness. Thank God that no matter how deep the hole has gotten, no matter, no matter how broken you are, whether it's something that was done to you, whether you chose to do some things and you started participating in it, none of that matters. Because when Jesus is standing before a woman who is clearly guilty of the sin that she's been accused of, not only do the Pharisees know it, she knows it too. And she stands ready for judgment. And instead of judgment, she gets grace. So what does that look like? 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is a fascinating scripture. It starts out and it says, and God is faithful. Another place it says, even when I am faithless, God is still faithful to me. So it turns out it's not about you at all. It goes on, it says, God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. There is always grace 
there's always the potential for freedom. This woman was caught seemingly with no way out. And Jesus, the only one who could condemn her, would not do it. The only one who could throw a rock wouldn't lift a rock. But look at what he didn't say. He didn't say, that's too much sin. You went one sin too far. I can't forgive that. No, he, he forgave her. Why? Because he was the only one who could. Nobody else could forgive her. The man that she slept with, maybe he could try to forgive her, and maybe that would help some. But she knew that whatever had been done inside of her own soul, that truthfully, she hadn't just sinned against that man or this culture or her own kids. She had sinned against the one who had made her. And now the one who had made her was standing in front of her. And the one who had made her, the only one who can condemn her, the only one who was 100% pure and righteous, rather than condemn her for her sin, ultimately he's going to offer her his own righteousness as a gift. The only one who could condemn her would not. And then he said this, it's so amazing. Go and leave your life of sin. Why? Why was that so powerful? Because in this forgiveness, in grace... There was a second chance. There's an interesting scripture, and I'm closing with this. This is Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us, if you notice this, this pops up numerous times, let us do something about this. Remember the indicatives and the imperatives from last week? Because Jesus has done this, now I can do this. Jesus says, hey, I forgive you. Now, because I forgive you, go and leave your life of sin. Leave the lifestyle. Make new habits. Begin to make new friends. Maybe make some choices about what you're going to spend your time in. What, oh, I, I should read the Bible, but I don't have any time. Yes, you do. Turn the TV off. Put, up, put down your phone. I don't know if you know this. Your phone has an off button. They don't advertise it, but it's there. You can turn all this stuff off, and you can spend some time in God's Word. It's like, but yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't taste like sugar. No, not yet. <laughs> right? Broccoli doesn't taste good, but, it, but it's better for you, right? It turns out healthy food often doesn't taste as good as the other stuff. But if you keep eating healthy food, something begins to happen in your body over time. And this is what Jesus is saying. Because you've been forgiven, because grace has come to you, there's a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance and a fifth chance. Why? Because grace teaches us. It doesn't condemn us. Grace doesn't command us. It teaches us to say no to sin. How? Listen to what it says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. You know, I've heard people preach that and say, hey, because all of the saints who've gone before you are leaning over the post of heaven and watching you, you better do right. I'm like, how did you turn a grace message passage into condemnation? And the answer is because the religious... And maybe you've done that yourself. Maybe there's so, so much religion in you because somewhere you're like, I know I don't deserve this. That's fine. And that's true. But at some point, we're not talking about what you think. We're talking about what he said and what he did. And so he comes and he says, because there's such a great cloud of witnesses, why? Because they also know what grace feels like. Because every one of these people, this cloud of witnesses, are trophies of grace. Every one of them were standing at some point in their life in the same place that woman. And this morning, maybe that's where you are. You're standing in that place of brokenness. You're, playing, you're standing in that place and you're going, I just don't know. I, I feel like it's, it's the harder I try, the further I get away from God. And God's like, hey, here's a thought. What if you quit trying? What if you quit trying and just received a gift? What if you quit trying to do something you're never, ever going to do anyway? You're never gonna, it's never going to be possible that you're going to live right enough to please God. It's never going to happen, and that's the point. And you finally understand that, and you get the gospel of grace, and then all of a sudden you realize there's so much grace. We sang that song this morning. That's the thing that when it begins to capture your heart, there's, it's like, Lord, but I've done this. And God says, I know, but there's so much grace. And I'm like, Lord, I keep looking at the stuff that I've done. And God's like, it's not like you didn't do it. I'm not saying that's okay. I'm just saying that this in comparison to grace is nothing. You think you send away your day of grace. And God says, no, I've graced away your day of sin. And the beautiful picture then is what would it look like then if I lived in this place? Listen, this is Titus 2. It's grace teaches it's it, grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, to say no to the temporary stuff. Why? It goes on. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. How does it do that? Because grace, the moment when you're standing, feeling the condemnation, and if you're honest, you deserve every bit of it. 
Maybe something bad happened to you. Maybe you were abused as a child. Maybe something happened to you, and I get it. It's the brokenness begets brokenness. But at some point, you choose to participate in the brokenness for your own pleasure and your own design. Maybe as revenge. Maybe I'll do damage to other people because look at what, what has been done to me. And, and in somewhere in your heart, you feel that that's right, but you know it's not. And you're standing in that moment, in the moment where all of the condemnation that could come upon you is released in a moment because Jesus says, where are your accusers? And so if you think people are around you accusing you, they're not going to stand around long once they see grace, right? Because they can't. They can't continue to accuse you without accusing themselves. And that was the point Jesus made in that moment. But then something else happened. He said, where are those who accuse you? The Pharisees had accused her. The others were looking on her with shame and all those things. But the one who's standing there, when he asked the question, where are your accusers? He was including himself. Where are your accusers? Do I accuse you? So let me ask you this question. Do you know the answer to that? Do you know the answer to what are you accused of? Is it something so big that the grace of God can't wipe it away in one fell swoop? What is the cross? The cross is a message to you saying, whatever your sin, no matter how great, was not more powerful than the blood of a righteous man on that day. And it was wiped away forever. So here's last scripture, Hebrews 4. So then, since, see this is that, that context. Since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, who are, he, when he came to heaven, he came because he was a righteous, he was the only righteous man. He has entered heaven. Jesus, the Son of God, let us do something. We have to do something. What is it? Hold firmly. That means you had a hold of it already. Somewhere you had the revelation of grace and maybe you let it go. Hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. He didn't look at the woman and say, your sin is okay. But having felt the temptation of sin, he understood what that temptation felt like. It's not okay, but he understands it. He understood our weakness. Why? Because he faced all the same testings we do, yet he never sinned. He goes on, verse 16. So let us come boldly. When's the last time you came boldly before the throne of our gracious God or the throne of, uh, the, uh, throne of grace? Because here's what happens when you do that. There we will receive his mercy. And we will find grace to help us. When? When we're doing it right? When we're living a great life for Jesus? Oh, no. When we need it most. So before I pray for you, that phrase is a very interesting phrase, the throne of grace. Obviously, it implies royalty. Remember what Spurgeon said about, about this life of royalty? There's something beautiful about what God is offering you in this life of royalty. The phrase, the throne of grace, is translated ultimately in English. The place from which grace is dispensed. So here's the thing. You are never going to find grace in the world. You're just not. Because the only place grace is dispensed is the one place where all of the sin was paid for at the cross. And now the Bible says that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. What, what's he doing? He is dispensing grace. To who? To people who don't need it? First of all, those people don't exist. Second of all, what's grace for? Grace is for when you need it most. So I just want to challenge you this morning as I pray for you. Do you know that you have been forgiven past tense? But how do you live out now the moments in your life where you go, I've fallen back into a pattern of sin like I used to live into Am I actually even saved now? I've done some things that if I'm honest, I'm ashamed of. It's doing damage to me, to my family, to my cult, my society around me, whatever. My question to you is, what are you going to do with that information? When this woman stood before Jesus in her moment of greatest vulnerability, naked before everybody, accused and rightly so, and Jesus said to her, woman, no one accuses you, even me. I don't condemn you. And now, now you have this revelation. Go right now and do something about it. 
I don't know that she did. I don't know that she walked away and began to live. I hope, my hope is that she was one of the tons of people who followed Jesus around. Maybe she was in the 120 in that room, in in the upper room on that day. Maybe she's part of the disciples and maybe we're gonna get to talk to her when we get to heaven. I don't know if any of that's true because everything in Jesus leaves us hanging. We don't know, why? Because he put, he put that woman in a moment. He tells the story where the woman is a moment. Why? Because he wants to tell the story about a broken, hurting woman? No, because he's telling a story about you and about me. And that's where you are this morning. Where are you in this context of how am I living this out? Do I really believe that grace is big enough to, to forgive me even of that? What if I sin tomorrow? Is grace big enough to do that? If you don't think that grace is big enough for that, here's what's going to happen. If you don't believe that grace sets you free, the moment you sin, the only thing you have left is condemnation. And it'll destroy you from the inside out. It will break you. The enemy will lie to you. He will accuse you. He will tempt you into sin. He then will accuse you. Then he will condemn you. Who will get others to condemn you. And if you can't hear the voice of Jesus saying, I don't condemn you. All you'll ever do is you'll go down that darkness until it takes its full course and you end in tragedy. But God's plan and his purpose is, no, no, no. I want to create a a room full of trophies of grace that you begin to walk in the fullness. You begin to have happiness that's beyond the happiness of this world and you begin to walk into joy. Why? Because what you're sensing, what you're feeling, the forgiveness, the purpose, the destiny, the living for another world besides just this one, it begins to grow inside of you and then it begins, it begins to be palpable. I remember when I met the guy who ended up leading me to the Lord, I said, I don't know what this guy is, but I, I love him and I hate him at the same time. And then later on, I came across a scripture that said that, that, that this concept of salvation, this grace, it's, it's like in us, it's like a, an aroma of life unto life. That's the good part. I rec- oh, I want whatever that is, I want it. And also death unto death. Why? Because the more I long for grace, the more I realize I don't deserve it. And the question isn't understanding that first part. It's, it's, it's actually what are you going to do with the second part? Can you reconcile in your own heart that Jesus' grace and his kindness and his goodness is greater than your sin? And if you can't, you're going you're gonna to turn out to be one of these religious people. And if I'm honest, no one's going to want to be around you, including you. But if you can get a grasp on this, now not only do you see yourself as forgiven and that Jesus will continue to forgive you as you grow and you walk in that purpose and that destiny with him, but also something else begins to happen. Because the Bible says, to whom much has been forgiven, they love much. And the picture isn't that some people have way more sin than others. Maybe that's true. But the picture is it's the people who've seen their sin accurately, like this woman who was in that moment where she couldn't miss it. And now Jesus is pointing this out and he goes, now you're forgiven. Go right now. Leave this lifestyle of sin. Why? Because whatever sin promised you, first of all, it's never going to give you. But everything I'm promising you right now in this moment, you can have. Is that where you are in your walk with Jesus? I hope it is. So let me pray for you. Lord, as we come before you, first of all, Lord, we say, Lord, your thoughts about happiness were not at all what we think they might have been. Lord, holiness and happiness can coexist. As a matter of fact, that's where the joy comes from, Lord. And so as we live a life of purpose, live a life of holiness, Lord, live a life of being set apart for a mission, for a purpose, to love others the way we've been loved, Something about that, Lord, makes people want to be around us. Jesus, sinners wanted to be around you. So, Lord, would you make us into people like that, people like you, not religious, um, twisted, broken, hurting people who condemn others, Lord, but people who recognize the depth of our own salvation, the depth of our own forgiveness, what we have been so deeply forgiven for. And, Lord, because of that, the purpose that we've been called to. Lord, would you open in us a place of happiness that moves beyond what this world could offer and moves us into joy that is actually eternal. And for that, Lord, we pray in your name. Amen. If you need prayer up here this morning, we'll have our team. We also have, on um, every Sunday we do this, we pray for you. And these words of knowledge are designed to capture your heart, we hope, that as the Lord reveals these things to the people who are praying for you and you see them, you go, oh, wow, God's actually talking to me. 
And the truth is, any of these things, if they resonate with you, that's an, in, that's an invitation from the Lord to say, if I'm offering this to other people, I'll offer it to you as well because that's his character and his nature. So if any of these resonate with you, come up. We'd love to pray for you. Our team will be up here to pray for you. Otherwise, have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Sunday.